I think we, we're experiencing a macro regime shift. I don't think this is a bear market rally. I think this is a change in the macro regime. I look at rates, I look at liquidity, I look at the dollar. All of those are suggesting that we're in for a, a much better period. And I think this risk rally continues. And they're the things that I'd look at and, and would value over recession fears or earnings, you know, related fears. I think this macro dynamic is very different to one that we experienced in 2022 and is going to be a lot more supportive for risk and, and certainly the beat and up uh, high beta plays like crypto and, and tech. David Bacall has over 18 years of macro sales and trading experience, working at the likes of the Royal Bank of Scotland, the Royal Bank of Canada, HSBC, and is even present at Lehman Brothers during the 2008 Great Financial Crisis. He is currently head of institutional sales for Paradigm, where he gets to see the real-time institutional money flows that allows him to see and glean some really interesting insights into what the crypto market is currently doing. In this episode, we dive into his macro framework and how he sees the current dynamics playing out. He's a lone wolf on a few of his forecasts, which made us all the keener to speak with him. Hey David, how's it going? Yeah, good, thanks guys. How are you? Not bad. Really good. It's great to see you again. Um, before we kind of dive into the meat, of, um, the meat of the macro, do you think you could give us a quick overview of your background and what you currently do? Yeah, sure. So, um, so currently I'm at Paradigm. Um, so we're an institutional liquidity network for trading crypto derivatives. Um, so essentially a, an execution platform for trading OTC, uh, crypto options and, and future spreads, um, as well as a few other things in the DeFi space, um, such as like Dove auctions and we facilitate those. Um, so I'm, I'm currently in London, um, heading up the, this, the sales business in London um, and just building out the business, uh, bringing more institutions onto the platform and, and helping develop the business here. Uh, before that, um, I, I actually spent about 18 years uh, macro trading and sales in banks. Um, so my background is very much in sort of economics and macro. Um, started off in the rate side uh, at various banks, of which um, I was at Lehman's in 08. Um, so I experienced that. Uh, from there, moved uh, moved from uh, after Lehman's blew up uh, into the FX side um, and yeah, I was, I was at HSBC for quite a few years. Uh, and then more recently, I was at Royal Bank of Canada for about seven years. Um, so that, that was kind of macro FX sales and trading, uh, co-ran a prop book um, hmm. at RBC. And yeah, so, so most of my background has been talking to hedge funds um, about all things macro and, and sort of looking at sort of trade ideas um, and trading around that. Um, I, I fell down the crypto rabbit hole about eight years ago now, I guess, um, come to it very much from, from the macro side of things. So um, post Lehman's, um, a big part of my kind of macro thesis was writing about the Japanification of the Western world, the, the idea that um, we're going to need ever larger central bank balance sheets, which will necessitate ever lower interest rates. Um, I'm still of that view, even though obviously we're going through this hike cycle at the moment. Um, I still, I still, and you know, the Fed are doing quantitative tightening and, and all these things. I think that's going to be pretty short lived and we'll revert back to this sort of longer term trend of, of sort of low rates, um, expansive balance sheets. Um, and as part of that thesis, essentially for me, um, in 08, like the kind of banking system and, and the fiat monetary system, um, reached its kind of natural end, end point and, really, you know, in, in a, a real capitalist world should have been allowed to, to just reset itself um, and, and wash itself out and wash all that leverage that I've built up over years out. Mm. Um, but obviously that's quite a painful um, decision for anyone to take uh, to, uh, to sit back and allow to happen. So we intervene and ev effectively what happened during that time with the interventions, be it from government or central banks, was um, they've, they've essentially artificially inflated assets um, because the assets, the financial assets were the collateral that was underpinning the entire financial system. So, so because of that, one, once you, once you open that door, you can never fully, uh, fully close it, uh, which is why, you know, we'll need ever larger central bank balance sheets. Um, and, and when that, anyone questions me on that, uh, one of the things I kind of point to is, you know, quite recently, um, we, we need to have the UK gilt market blow up 
and uh, quite quickly, even though the Bank of England have been hiking rates, they had to intervene and, and buy up the gilt. So it can't exist without their support. Um, so that, that led me into this idea of, OK, um, you know, what's the end game of all of this? And, and obviously the, the impact of this is um, to debase fiat currency. So assets went up, asset owners got rich, wage earners got poor. Um, and we had this big inequality divide. And, and I, I didn't know what the end game would be because I know that, you know, the powers above would not let it, the system collapse. Um, so then Bitcoin came along and, and looked quite interesting. You know, maybe, maybe we'll, you know, migrate to a new system. Um, and that kind of first sort of drew me, my interest into uh, crypto and Bitcoin. And then I started to see like the protocols and, and platforms being sort of built for, for this digital age. Um, and then I was down that rabbit hole. So I, I got involved um, at, at, as an investor, uh, mainly sort of buy and hold type stuff, uh, really badly sort of ran some scalping bots for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> nice. but, but yeah, did, didn't make much money at all. I was completely out of my debt from that. Um, a couple of years ago, I was, was part of a, an early seed round for a green Bitcoin mining company in Norway. Um, so I'd kind of been building, uh, my interest was growing. Um, so I was kind of looking to take my career down that path. I uh, wanted to set up maybe a crypto research trading desk um, at, at the bank. Um, I think they thought I was having like a midlife crisis or, or something, uh, kept banging on about crypto and whatnot. Um, were, they, were they against it? Yeah, yeah, they just, just were, were at the time, um, it's, it's just a Ponzi, um, you know, did, kind of didn't get it. And, and I was a little bit like that, you know, at least hear me out. Um, let me make the business case for it. Hmm. Um, but, but even now, right, I, you know, Jamie Diamond speaking the other week, um, you know, talking rubbish as usual, like, you know, there's, there's just a um, reluctance to just to be open to it. And, and mm -hmm. I can get that there's, there's lots of scams in the space, like any yeah. new technology, any new kind of uh, nascent industry, you're always going to get the scammers that, that just see, see the opportunities to quick, make a quick buck. But, um, but you know, that it, it's kind of overlooking um, the potential in this space and, and the technology and, and some of the problems that it addresses. But yeah, so I was looking to take my career into the space. Uh, COVID hit, kind of pushed me back a little bit. And then uh, ended up um, finally sort of making the jump, um, joined the crypto prime brokers, Bquant, uh, was there for a short space of time. Um, and But I, I think my, obviously my interests and passions from the trading side that, um, you know, paradigm come along and um, it was just probably a, a better fit for me and, and align more of my interests. Say so we, we are, we've got a front row seat here to like the biggest institutional flows in, in the market for crypto. Uh, dealing with all the big crypto funds um, and it's exciting you know we, we're building the platform and products that I am we take for granted in the traditional space um, but that mm. crypto badly needs to, to allow the access and the liquidity and the scalability for, for the big hedge funds and institutions to come into the space and, and run those those trading strategies that that they would have run in TradFi. Hmm. I want to kind of go on to then your recap of the last few years and where we are now. But beforehand, could you kind of just quickly explain what you mean by like inflating the assets and the collateral underpinning the system to say someone who might not know what, what any of that really means as if we were kind of five years old? Yeah, sure. So fiat driven economies, i.e. fiat being sort of the cash, if you think of it like that, um, so essentially, they've survived on credit, right, or debt, um, which is effectively what, what we're talking about. So, so unless productivity and income goes up, right, to service that to service that debt, um, that, and to grow and, and and keep keep kind of growing, then either either the debt grows um, or, or you pay back the debt, and the only way you can you can keep the growth what's paying back the debt is, is say for your productivity and income to go up. So productivity actually, certainly in the UK and uh, in the US has, has been declining. Um, and that's a whole topic as to why that's been the case. So without productivity and real wages increasing, then the only, only way in these economies to grow is, is to have more debt. Mm. Now, when rates were higher, um, then as rates came down, came lower because then we got the growth slowdowns 
Mm. And then rates came lower. Then you're able to borrow more debt, right? So if you could afford, let's say, think of it in mortgage terms, if you could afford, say, a £100,000 mortgage um, at a rate of 5% uh, and the interest on that, then if rates come down to 2.5%, if your income hasn't gone up, you can now afford a £200,000 mortgage, right? So debt was able to keep expanding. Assets, co uh, consequently, were, were sort of going up in value. And this is kind um, of over the last 40 years, right? Basically since the end of the 70s, 80s, yeah, yeah. or more, more like 80s. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you, you can like, you know, that there's uh, obviously the kind of end of the the, the sort of Bretton Woods um, system of, of um, like the gold standard and tying currencies to gold. That's when we came into this fiat currency world where, where the currencies aren't actually backed by anything mm. um, and they were free to print them. And then you had... Um, like the um, the whole the sort of period of the eighties with financial deregulation, um, and then the explosion of sort of products that that made it easier to, well, on paper to diversify risk and, and package a lot of this risk up and then sell it back on, um, and all those things obviously led up to to oh eight and what happened in the financial crisis. But once once we got to the zero bound. Um, of rates, then it's really difficult then to expand uh, your debt anymore because, oh, I can't afford any more. So the only way at that point to then borrow more is to borrow against your assets. So you use assets as collateral to then borrow more against. So the whole system in 08 became leveraged to, to the value of collateral. Bank, banks particularly and, and, and financial institutions could then borrow against the value of all this collateral and be that collateral, be bonds or, or whatever they were holding. You're then borrowing against that value. P people borrowing mortgages and remortgaging houses are borrowing against the value of their property, right? So all of a sudden, if the value of that collateral, if the value of those assets start to fall, then you become quite quickly a negative, negative equity. Mm. Um, then you can't, you can't borrow anymore. And then you start to kick off this whole sort of snowball of where your assets are falling and then you, you go from a position of what becomes what was a liquidity problem this is what happened with lehman right it was a liquidity problem to start with then to raise the cash to to sort of fund fund that liquidity shortfall you have to sell your assets yeah. then you force to sell your assets the value of those assets fall then you're so it's more collateral <laughs> yeah and and then you, you you kick off this spiral um where essentially then you quite quickly, a, a liquidity issue becomes a solvency issue um, and then everyone's bankrupt and then no one can borrow and growth collapses and you go into recession or what we were looking at in 08, um, a depression sort of mode. So essentially the answer to that was, well, let's, re, let's reflate the assets. Let's reflate the assets on the back. By printing. By printing money and buying them essentially. So it started off with... You know, central banks would buy the government assets, which a lot of central banks, uh, which a lot of banks, whatever, held on their balance sheet. So all of a sudden it starts pumping those up and then it pushes people further out the, the risk curve. So if if someone own, owns the bonds, they're selling it back to essentially the banks and the central banks. Um, so then they go, right, what do I do with this cash? So then they go and buy something else. So then you basically start to reflate the assets in the system. And all of a sudden, people go back into a, a sort of positive equity uh, sort of balance. People can then start borrowing because the value of their assets have gone up and then they can use that as the collateral again. So the whole system needs this the value of assets, which is collateral to borrow against, to be inflated. So then you can carry on borrowing. And we go through these periodic episodes like we, we're in at the moment where, you know, we, we've got uh, an inflationary burst, which we, we, we know... Kind of, I, I think we know well the reasons to that. This was this was COVID. Uh, this was massive fiscal spend during COVID at a time when we had supply chain disruption. Um, so people had a load of cash literally put in their pockets that they couldn't really spend anywhere, um, buying stuff on Amazon and wherever else that couldn't get delivered to them. Prices went up, and we're kind of working off that excess. Um, but but yeah, so. So, so they, at the moment, they're in a position where they want to kind of deflate demand a little bit. So they're, they're happy to do quantitative tightening, hike rates, and, and just see that leverage sort of come out. But quite quickly, and we're seeing already, you'll see growth start to fall very, very rapidly because the growth doesn't exist without, without the debt and the borrowing. 
Um, and then the only way people will be able to borrow is if the assets and the value of their assets go up and that's the collateral that they'll use to borrow against. So mm. if the value of their collateral has gone down, they're not going to be able to borrow. So then when we need to kick off growth again, which we're probably going to need to do, I mean, if you look at um, what's going on in the UK at the moment, but probably, I, I think today for the first time, um, markets are pricing in cuts by the end of this year now from the Bank of England. Um, despite the inflation we're seeing, but because we're, we're, we're now rapidly approaching a, a recession pretty quickly. So they're going to need people to start essentially borrowing and, and spending again. And to do that, you, you're going to need to have, uh, you, you can't do that in a, um, in a situation where house prices are collapsing and the value of assets are going down. So at some point, the bank's going to need to encourage and reflate asset prices so people can then have the collateral to borrow against and then we can carry on growing and, and keep this keep this sort of merry-go-round going mm. fascinating what's your kind of timeline for the next say six to two years then because i know you're in you're one of the few in the camp that the new well another bull market is around the corner um even though say like despite most people think in recession because like the yield curves super inverted and as you say growth will slow down um what is it that leads you to believe that the kind of the growth slow down the fall in earnings won't kind of bring everything down first before we resume um instead of carrying on from now i think um i think my kind of framework um like for me the two most important things are rates and liquidity so rates and liquidity drive everything it took me as a macro guy, it took me quite a few years after Lehman um, and, and amidst all this QE that was going on, it took me quite a few years to accept the reality of that, that we're now in a world where it's about rates and liquidity. It's not about fundamentals. So I've, I've worked with, uh, in my time, like some of the big perma bears out there, like the Albert, Albert Edwards of the world and, and these guys. And they, they all make really good fundamental points that it's hard to argue with. But the point that they perhaps missed was that we're a function of rates and liquidity. So if rates come lower and, and they turn the liquidity hose back on, assets are going to go up. So for me, you need to look at what, what rates are doing, where liquidity is going, what the Fed's doing, what central banks are doing. And mm. that, that for me will overpower any talk of recession, any kind of um, earnings recession and, and sort of poor earnings um, results. I, I kind of think that doesn't really matter. And, and when anyone argues against me on that, I, I always point to look, 2020. Uh, we had, what, the deepest recession since, since post, well, po deepest post-war recession. And yet stocks sort of hit record highs during that time. After the initial big sell-off, as soon as the Fed come out and turned the printing press on. And, and I, I actually, I, I wrote a piece, um, I think it was in April of 2020. I, I was waiting... I was waiting at the time for two things. Um, I was waiting for the Fed to come out and do unlimited QE. And post-08, um, and I wasn't really in a position during those years um, to, to really invest in, in any kind of serious way. Um, but I, I always remember thinking, next time we have a crisis and the Fed come out and do QE, and my, and my brother actually worked in a hedge fund, and I said, I've said to him for all those years, next time we have a crisis and the Fed come out <laughs> and start doing QE, everyone's going to tell me it's not the time to buy because they're doing QE because we're in a crisis. Mm. Just, just remind me to ignore that and, and just sort of get, you know, load up on, on everything, high beta, NASDAQ, mm. you know, I would say crypto and what have you, because it were a function of liquidity and rates that came out in, in, uh, in, in April, 2020 in response to the, um, the COVID crisis. And I sent out a piece called a, 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 a dichotomous risk rally and, essentially was calling for this, this dichotomy whereby um, the global economy was going to be in its deepest post-war recession, yet we were going to see uh, equities hit um, record highs. And at the time, that got uh, hedge fund guys I spoke to were like, you know, ridiculed it. So you, this is ridiculous. And every time it's this time is different. And there's always good reasons why this time mm. is different. Um, mm. And it's like, look, that worked, that worked back in in... 08 and the years sort of through that it, it won't work again but it always works because that liquidity has to go somewhere and, and it doesn't really go into the real economy it goes into financial assets so within that framework for me it, it is about what the fed do what rates do what liquidity does now the pushback that i accept against that view is if 
inflation stays high and the Fed can't ride to the rescue um, and, and turn the liquidity hose on or can't uh, cut rates quickly enough. Um, so I, I, I kind of see that pushback. I actually am of the view that we will inflation's going to fall as quickly as it as it went up. Um, I think yesterday there was money uh, like M2 money supply growth data out and, that, and that's now negative. Um, and if you look at that chart, it, it ramped up obviously over mm. the last year. It's come down very quickly. And if you overlay, overlay inflation like with a lag to that, um, you'll see that. I, I think there's a good chance that um, certainly inflation comes sub 2% at probably later, later point of this year and, and maybe even goes negative um, and they overshoot on the downside to, to their inflation targeting. So there, there's this kind of stale narrative out there that, um, that inflation admittedly has peaked, but um, it's not going to get back to 2% anytime soon. I kind of disagree with that. I mean, if it doesn't, um, then yeah, may maybe then we rethink, but, but I still think the lows are in for these markets because if I think about where we've come from and where we're going, we, we had to price like the sharpest tightening cycle in, in Fed history um, last year um, on, on a relative basis um, and percent wise from where they started. Um, we, so we, we had to price that central banks everywhere were hiking rates. We had inflation was on the uptrend, um, and, and obviously sort of peaking at around sort of 10%. We're now in a world where we're peak inflation, um, and clearly inflation's coming lower. Um, we're now in a world where the fed are nearing the pause, um, which is going to come in March. Um, so again, how long they hold those rates there, I, I don't think it's really as important as the fact that. The market will price a pause is always followed by a cut so the markets will price a cut so i kind of think the the macro regime is completely different to 2022 and yet i feel people are still trying to trade the 2022 playbook um so yes i i think we probably see recession how deep that is uh, i'm not sure um I, I think earnings might be soft um but yeah, I, I don't think that matters um, if we're in a position where liquidity is bottomed, more liquidity is pumping in and the Fed start looking at cutting rates and certainly if other central banks follow suit. Um, I, I started to make this call like late November, early December saying that like, I think we've bottomed. Um, so I, I, I monitor those things. I monitor rates. I monitor liquidity. I monitor the dollar as well put into liquidity um, and kind of and monitor flows. I was just going to touch back on the COVID thing. So, like, do you think that was just, like, a catalyst to, like, accelerate everything? Or do you think it would have, like, played out differently if it didn't happen? Well, interestingly, like, in, into that, we, into 2020, um, you know, it, it looked like we were kind of heading uh, towards a growth slowdown in a way. Mm. Um, and... Yeah, that, so it kind of obviously sped that up and it put it on steroids and it put... <laughs> the central bank's reaction on steroids. Um, so I, I'm not of the view that we'll, we'll see the same level of, uh, certainly not the same level of intervention um, and liquidity pumped back into the market as we saw back then. Um, but but I, I think we see enough that we see um, a decent rally, particularly in the high beta stuff that's been really beaten up over the last year. And um, of, obviously sort of crypto um, is going to be that high beta. Um, I mean, there's other things as well that I think is interesting. Um, and and it's, it's funny because like pe when people are saying to me about, you know, we, we've not priced this recession stuff, I think people forget that like typically markets start to price things, you know, price the future state of the world, like, you know, mm. 12 months out um, or, or so. Let, let's, let's call it 12 months out. So I kind of think what's coming has been priced throughout the last sort of year effectively could see that the, the Fed are, in my mind, o over tightening at this point um, and the problem is going to cause. You've seen some of the the sort of big tech names get absolutely smashed. Um, you've seen crypto obviously down 70, 80 percent. Um, so I, I kind of think we've priced a lot of bad news. And then the question then for me becomes, OK, uh, what what's what's the catalyst now for, um, you know, a deeper sell off than what we've already experienced? Mm. And for me, I don't, I don't know if, if the Fed, particularly if the Fed end up cutting rates, I don't know if markets that have, you know, survived the last year, don't forget as well, we had a Russian war kick off last year. 
So we've had so much bad news to contend with. Perfect storm. <laughs> it, 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 exactly. So it's kind of like, it, you. What, what do you think gets worse um, than, than what we've already experienced? And if, if central banks start just going a little bit easier, um, and everything's about as well, like rates of change and direction of travel. So like, that even the fact that the Fed have started to to slow the pace of hikes, that's that's important for markets because it's about rates of change and directions of travel. F- Fifty went to twenty five, twenty five goes to zero, zero goes to minus twenty five. Like it's that direction. And when you think of it, and uh, you, we get caught up in the day to day like machinations of of markets and what have you, and just the reaction to the different data points. But but when you look now, it seems kind of obvious to say that, do you know what? When the Fed started slowing the pace of hikes, despite people going, yeah, they're still hiking up. We know they're hiking, but we're prepared for that. The pace and the direction of travel is now going towards less tightening, albeit marginal tightening. If you, if you thought about that, then really you could have gone in December, right? Yeah, they're slowing down the pace of hikes. I can get long now. <laughs> mm. um, and and, and some, sometimes I think these things are are easier uh, than what we, we like to allow ourselves to believe. And I think I think that's what you need to play um, and just try and get right what the Fed are doing. Um, other pushbacks I get to that are the fact that, well, we've still got quantitative tightening going on. And as a, as a liquidity proponent, um, you know, how does that affect my view? There's a couple of interesting things on that. Um, Firstly, uh, you, you know, you've got this debt ceiling that we've hit in the US um, that everyone's talking about. Now, a, a big, an important part of the Fed balance sheet um, is the Treasury general account that's held um, at the Fed. So again, to keep this quite simple, when the, when the Treasury need money, uh, they issue bonds, raise cash, they put that cash at the Fed, and then as they, as they need it to use it, they will, you know, they, they'll draw down on it. But whilst they're building those balances, they're, they're issuing bonds and they're, they're drawing money out of the system. So investors investors buy the bonds. So they're sucking cash out of the system and then they're placing it with the Fed. When they're, when they're drawing that down, they're spending it on whatever they're spending it on. Um, they're putting that back into the economy. So there's an injection of liquidity back into the economy. So when the debt ceiling gets hit, they can't, they can't issue any more debt. So they're, they're now in, in a stage where they need to just draw down on their cash balances. So we've now got quite a big, powerful offset to the quantitative tightening that's, that's going on because they're, they're drawing that money down, which is going to go on to what, April or May before, I think may, maybe even June before they actually hit crunch time. Um, and then the debt ceiling will get raised again. And then potentially then that might be the time that that risk then has another wobble. But again, we'll see what's happening around that time. Um, you've also got uh, the reserve repo uh, facility. Um, which again, I want to keep this quite simple, but the Fed essentially used to keep um, a floor on rates in, in the money market. So, so money market funds will, will sort of buy sort of uh, treasury bills and, and, um, and short maturity debt because uh, they, they need the liquidity and, and they need that, that money back. Obviously that demand will then start to force yields down. So then you have the reserve repo facility that will offer a higher rate of interest to then then give you an alternative and then that that stops the demand for for the money market instruments and, and yields going down there's about there's over two trillion dollars worth parked at the fed every night so as front end rates have been coming up uh where the, the, the fed are hiking rates that money's starting to leak back out of the reserve repo facility and come back into markets so again that that's another form of like liquidity injection if you like into the markets so there's powerful offsets to the quantitative tightening and then also, if you look at the big four central bank balance sheets that have the Fed, ECB, China and Bank of Japan, that's actually starting to turn higher again. So effectively, China and the Bank of Japan, their expansion of their balance sheets is um, overpowering the contraction that you're seeing at the ECB and the Fed. So the liquidity situation's improved quite dramatically. Rates have clearly peaked. You know, we've seen 10 year yields sort of. Uh, break lower. We've seen two-year yields uh, over the last couple of weeks start to break lower. Um, so I'm looking at the rates. Um, I'm looking at liquidity. They've improved markedly. Um, I'm looking at the dollar. The, the dollar is important for all of this because uh, the dollars that, that that dollar wrecking ball that that strangles global growth. I think there's like 17 trillion dollars worth of debt outside of the U.S. So when the dollar goes up, 
your, your debt servicing costs are going up. Mm. Um, and that's what causes all these problems across emerging markets. So the dollar's coming lower, which everyone can breathe a little bit easier. Um, so, so yeah, like we're in a much better environment than we were um, throughout 2022 when all these things were going the other way. Um, so whilst these things are unfolding, and I, I think we've probably got a good run ahead of us of, of that happening, um, then, yeah, I, I, I think the lows are in. And I think that's going to overpower any concerns around recession or, or weak earnings and all these other things. Hmm. Coming back to then March 2020, so you you switched bullish after the Fed kind of pivoted, came out, did QE following the crisis. Why yeah. this time are you kind of switching bullish before they've done that? Or do you think that the markets will kind of lead that decision more? Yeah, I, I think uh, markets will trade in anticipation of it. Um, and I think that's what we're starting to see, as, as well as starting to see um, like the, these things ease. say starting to see liquidity sort of move higher, starting to see rates come lower. Mm. So, so it, it's anticipation of it, but it's also happening. It's also playing out. So people who are kicking back saying, "How's anyone bullish in this market?" I'm like, "Well, you've got to look at even the current situation and say." things are easier than they were uh, in terms of liquidity, in terms of rates. They're a lot easier than they were just a couple of months ago. So it makes sense that that markets and risks should be reacting positively to that. Mm. I mean, as well, we get like March 2020, like as well, you're in, you're in extreme situations there where the whole system freezes up. Mm. And, and it, it's funny because I, I wrote that macro piece, the dichotomous risk rally, and I, I was I was waiting to send it. Um, so Fed, I think it was the end of April. Um, someone can fact check me on this, but um, the Fed come out and, and announced basically unlimited QE. And I was waiting for um, a yen basis to normalize. Now, again, without getting too uh, technical about it, um, yen basis um, is which is kind of the the, the, the uh, a rate differential between sort of yen and, and dollar. Um, outside of what interest rates would suggest. Um, but, but essentially, when, when yen basis is blowing out, what it's telling you is that there's stress in the financial system. Like, no, everyone wants dollars. So there's a scramble for dollars in the system. So during when you have these blow-ups, um, like we had in 2020, everyone scrambles to get dollars. Everyone just needs dollars. Um, and that's why you then see the, the Fed open swap lines to mm. try and flood the market with dollars. So I was waiting for um, that yen basis to normalize, which would tell me that the financial system's like thawing out and money can start to flow now and money will start to flow and the QE that they're doing can start to flow. But again, QE predominantly flows into financial assets. It doesn't really get into the real economy. And the, and the difference and, and why like QE in itself is not inflationary, which is, again, another controversial point of view, but... Um, we had QE1, QE2, QE3, and all the time in inflation, we were kind of in this disinflationary world. Uh, the Bank of Japan uh, has a balance sheet, you know, something like in excess of like 40% um, of its GDP. It, it's it's huge. Um, and yet inflation's been, we've been in a disinflation world. The reason for that is because the, the money goes into financial assets uh, and into the financial economy. It's not into real economy. The big difference in 2020 was it was complemented by uh, fiscal. And so, so you could argue that the QE allowed the fiscal because it essentially it indirectly funded the government spending. Um, but it was actually all the fiscal spending that put cash directly into people's pockets that's driven the inflation. If you take that away and just have QE on its own, you'll just see assets go up and it won't have any impact on the real economy, which is what we've experienced really since 08. Mm. Um, and why you've, why you've had this uh, kind of inequality divide where sort of stocks and house prices and all these things have gone to silly levels. Meanwhile, sort of real wages and all these things have fallen and, and uh, you know, people are struggling to afford a house and people living in, in, in mom and pop basements and stuff. Mm. It's interesting you kind of saying that liquidity is all that really matters for you now because I remember seeing a few kind of leading indicators for liquidity, I think by like cross-border capital and like Real Vision and all of their leading indicators kind of show that, well, now is kind of the peak, peak in, well, no, the bottom in terms of liquidity. Um, yeah. Kind of, do you think there's a risk? I know, that, say, the rate of change of rates might not change much, but as more debt starts to get refinanced at a higher rate, do you think that kind of drains any liquidity 
and or kind of like these zombie comp- companies that you hear of that kind of live off all this debt? What's the kind of risk with those that they might pose to the market? Yeah, like I, I think, um, don't get me wrong here. Like I think, I think we're, we're heading for recession. Uh, how deep that is, I don't know. Um, but again, like, I, I, I just think people need to get their heads around the idea that the, the financial economy is not the real economy. Mm. Um, and, and there's that, there's that dichotomy. So again, I, I could see a situation similar to 2020 where, you know, we, we're in this deep recession and yet the NASDAQ's hitting like record highs mm. and everyone's going, how can this be, you know, we're in the recession. It's like, because the Fed are cutting rates again, the Fed are, are doing QE or providing liquidity to the market. But that that goes into the financial economy. It doesn't find its way into the real economy. The only way you really help the real economy is through sort of fiscal and and, and sort of doing the fiscal programs. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, I, I I think I think we're heading for a really tough time in the real economy. Um, and but this is like the bad news is good news, right? It's mm. Bad news is good news for financial markets. Now, yeah, the pushback to me on that is always well, we will hit a point where bad news is just bad news and market start to price that i think i think they only price that if the fed's hands are tied and they can't respond to it um if inflation starts to come down as i expect um and then the fed can start to ease off um then then i I think you'll see the financial economy start to perform pretty well Mm. also i kind of like you talking about everyone says maybe this time is different but oftentimes it's just the same and kind of like i think the two-year two years gone below the Fed funds rate, which is your typical, it's the end of the kind of hiking cycle. Um, I'm guessing this is kind of something that you agree with and you kind of see that we've basically, yeah, the pivot in say the next few months is kind of your base case then. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, obviously, they, they sort of leading into the pause um, in, in March, which, which you know, they're, they're, they're telling you in a way. Um, and then it's just a question of how long they, they hold that there. I mean, it's kind of futile, really, to look too far out um, because things change quickly. Mm. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of think if you're going to take a lead from anyone, it, you, you take it from the market, not from the Fed, um, because the, the market will probably be be more accurate. So, so that's why, you know, I think the market's pricing 50 bips of cuts by year end. Um, I mean, that, that to me, it does seem aggressive. But again, who knows how, how things play out? Um, mm. and, and we could, if we quite quickly snowball, I mean, the fed, everything the fed do in central banks in general is, is always looking through the rear view mirror. So, you know, they're looking at, they're looking at the labor market saying the labor market looks pretty strong, but like that, that is the biggest sort of lagging indicator. And they forget that, you know, policy acts with a 12 month flag really. Um, and this, this is why, this is why I say it gets met with some controversy, but this is why I think the fed have over tightened. Because when people say, how can you say that when we've still got inflation at, you know, 6%, 6.5% or have you, it's like, yeah, but if, if, you, if you can agree that monetary policy and the transmission of that happens with like a 12-month lag, 12 months ago, we were at zero rate still doing QE. Mm, so yeah. so we, we, didn't, you know, we didn't end that process until March. So um, I think over the next few months, you're going to really start to see the impact of that um that that will really start to buy inflation clearly is already uh, falling again like we kind of in the same way that the fed underestimated how quickly would inflation would go up um they probably you know they've got this nice scenario in the head where all right inflation's coming down now quite sharply but it'll kind of stop around two percent what what if inflation starts going to one percent and to zero mm. by the way like deflation is a much bigger problem when you're carrying <coughs> levels of debt Bless you. Uh, deflation is a much, much bigger problem when you're covering uh, when you're you're carrying the levels of debt that the US are, are carrying. Um, so, in fact, in a weird way, you want a little bit of inflation to inflate some of that debt away. But um, yeah, like it, it's not clear to me that every, everyone is burnt by like the Volcker years and and from like the late seventies. Um, but I tell you what, if, if you get into a deflationary spiral, that, that can be pretty nasty as well. And, and I would argue mm. that that's possibly a bigger risk when you're carrying the levels of debt that are out there in the world uh, to have deflations so that the real value of that debt is actually going up. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think things will will you'll see inflation come quite sharply lower. 
Um, and yeah, so may, maybe the market's right in pricing 50 bips of cuts by by year end. And I know that feels difficult to see now. Say, uh, labour market's a lagging indicator. Um, I'm not convinced by what we see in the official data. Um, it, there's there's a lot of contradictions in that data. We saw last month that, you know, solid uh, non-farm payrolls print, yeah, earnings was falling. Mm. Um, so you kind of go, how, how do those two uh, jive? And then the, the, the um, household survey um, has basically suggested that hiring has been flat over the past year. Um, and then you saw one of the Fed, um, one of the Fed uh, uh, banks sort of released that they they made an adjustment to their uh, payrolls numbers of about a million million uh, payrolls that that they overestimated, and that in fact it was like I think for Q one or Q two of of um, last year, it was actually ten thousand uh, additional heads instead of a million or whatever so yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced that the the numbers are, are, are quite right um in a way but either way they're a lagging indicator and um you know it, it's expensive to to let people go um and particularly if you need to rehire them so companies tend to hang on and hang on but then when the cuts come as, as you're seeing across tech um they don't they don't let people go slowly they they cut 20 percent of workforce you know and it happens pretty quickly and that's when the Fed go, oh shit, we've we've overdone it. Um, so I can see that, and it, it's kind of like like growth and and hiring is it's it's up the stairs and then it's it's down the elevator shaft. Mm. Um, I think we're probably approaching that point where we're going to fall down the elevator shaft, and and may, maybe sort of tech's leading the way on that. Mm. Um, Do you think we'll see but, any but more like, layoffs? Yeah, yeah, I think you'll see that start to spread, like for sure. I think as as we hit hit that recession. Um, it's funny as well, um, and to your point, like, so, you know, the, the numbers across tech haven't been great. Um, the layoffs are, are hitting hard. Um, you know, you've seen Google sort of laying people off. So more um, layoffs in January than the whole of last year. Yeah. And yet how's the NASDAQ performing? Right. It's, it's outperforming. <laughs> yeah. So kind of so, ties into then your whole base case then. Yeah. So kind of. Like in my mind, like the Nasdaq and tech kind of priced this months ago, and now it's going to lead the way out. And I actually, I actually think potentially, you know, if I look at crypto, crypto kind of priced the the tightening cycle was the first asset to price it, be, be it because it's higher beta, be it because it's the longest duration asset. But crypto but kind it's of twenty four seven as well. Yeah, exactly. So, so if if you look like like crypto kind of peaked what mid November of last year uh, of twenty twenty one. Yeah, um, that was kind of the peak, I think, uh, of say Bitcoin, um, and then started to come off, and then came off really sharply throughout January and, and, and February. Obviously, it's had its own idiosyncratic issues to deal with, uh, be it from the Luna blow up, and obviously more recently FTX. Um, but yeah, like I, I kind of feel that uh, crypto um started to price that hike hiking cycle in pretty early and i feel now it's pricing the end of that and what comes next which is why i'm, I'm pretty bullish sort of crypto um uh, throughout the course of this year mm. it's Excellent. interesting kind of i guess sort of closing up a bit then and coming on to crypto um i mean typically after like you've had this kind of brig price capitulation bear market we usually see kind of consolidation for like a year Maybe it's slightly higher end of year, but it's kind of mostly mostly choppy. Um, and we also kind of see, especially initially, altcoins continue to get wrecked as like Bitcoin dominance continues to rise. Um, before then, Bitcoin kind of leads then the next bull market and kind of we, we go around and do it all over again. Is that kind of your base case or do you think things will play out slightly differently this time? I think I think things are going to play out differently in the sense of um I, I think i think the time frames are going to be sped up partly because the extreme the extreme scenarios we've experienced since 2020 extreme money printing um and you know extreme inflation all these things so i think we're kind of on these kind of hyper cycles so things are being sped up a lot more quickly um i i also think if you look in crypto particularly um you know if, if you look at you know, if, if you look at, say, like, um, like the net network adoption, if you look at, like, 
um, you know, how these things are being used, th things have actually sort of stayed quite stable. So there's actual kind of real use of some of this stuff now in crypto. Uh, where, whereas in, yeah. Um, whereas in past markets, those things fell off quite quickly and what have you. That now actually that they've been a little bit more consistent. Um, so I kind of think that that's, that's forming more of a solid base. Um, what was quite interesting, I mean, you, you touched on Bitcoin dominance. We're seeing that uh, quite early this year, right? Um, uh, Bitcoin's kind of outperforming a lot Even of Even on the pumps, obviously. not just the dumps. Yeah, exactly. Um, I kind of feel at the moment it's actually being, and, and, and the institutional adoption is coming is coming pretty rapidly, I think, um, even after FTX, and we all kind of felt that might be dented. I kind of think the institutional flows are leading the way at the mm. moment. And certainly, um, like, I mean, we, we're, I think it was last week or the week before last, we had a near record week at Paradigm uh, for option flows. So which which we were pleasantly surprised about. I think after FTX, we thought it might take a while for some of that flow to return. But, you know, institutions have come, come out firing and strapping on risk. And it feels like they've still not got enough length on. And they're kind of having to chase chase these rallies a little bit. And so I think a lot of like the, the last couple of weekends when we've seen those pumps um, and, and we've spoken about it at Paradigm and, um, and we have our own sort of uh, YouTube video series called The Big Picture where, where we discuss this. But um, there's what we call um, like short, short gamma chasing. So sort of dealers essentially that have had to sell these call options to, to those that, that want to basically express a view that Bitcoin's going up. Well, the dealers essentially, because they sell those options, then they become short and they have what we call short gamma, which, which, again, without getting too technical, essentially what that means is that when to, to hedge and keep yourself neutral, when you're short gamma, when prices go up, you have to buy. And when prices come down, you have to sell. So you tend to exacerbate the moves. Mm. If you're long gamma, if you're long gamma, you actually contain the moves. So basically when, when markets are in a short gamma position, they, as we break levels, they're forced to chase the actual spot. So I kind of feel that you've you've actually seen a lot of these pumps as being um, sort of short gamma chasing by by dealers that are trying to hedge, and then that's forced liquidations. What we've not seen yet, it's not been driven by like these FOMO moves of retail coming in and and just aping into stuff. Smart money, so... only smart money at the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, I, I actually think for for um, this bull market, if we want to call it that now, to sustain, it's going to need retail to come in. So I've, I've been, you know, we, we've seen a few little, um, you know, some of the alts um, pump, like the whole uh, bonk thing, uh, Lido, a, a few of these things that have actually sort of pumped, which is for me a good sign that retail money is starting to come back into this space. Um, I thought that was, that was dead for a long time. So it's, it's quickly returning, I think. But we're going to need to see more of that. Um, so yeah, I, I think I think the cycles are going to play out a lot quicker, and because partly because I think the institutional money is coming in, um, and and it feels quite sticky as well, right? They're not they're, they're not just going to sort of give up on it when they put resource and, and money towards it. And like I was chatting to someone the other day about this as well. The if you're a crypto fund now, you have to be invested. Like it's like an emerging market fund or or any other fund. Um, you know, you, you have to be invested and um, it, you, you start to see markets rally against you and you're underweight, um, then then you have to kind of chase it. And actually, and, and, and that was another big point in terms of why I'm, I'm sort of bullish here on, on markets generally. Uh, Bank of America uh, released their fund manager survey the other week. And um, so, that they, again, just a survey where they, they ask all, all the big sort of asset managers, fund managers, you know, what their position is like and what their views are. And um, fund managers are carrying their biggest uh, underweight in U.S. equities um, basically since about 2005. So if these fund managers are underweight, now when I say underweight, it doesn't necessarily mean they're short the market, but it means that to their benchmark, they're underweight. Mm. They, the, these, these guys are judged on their performance to a benchmark. So if their benchmark is NASDAQ or S&P mm. and those things are rallying and they're now underperforming, they're now faced with a situation. Do I do I hope that it comes back um, so that, or, or do I have to start to reweight and just reweight up so that it's not getting too far away from me? Um, and I think now they're probably in a position where they're like, shit, I need to reweight. And I kind of think a similar thing uh, in crypto that 
a lot of people would have been underweight coming into this year. Let's see how things play out. And bang, all of a sudden, Bitcoin's up 30%. And now you're left chasing performance. Mm. And again, if, if you're not outperforming, say, Bitcoin, then why is anyone placing money with you as a fund? Um, you know, if that's your benchmark, you need to be outperforming it. So, so now, like, all of a sudden, people are kind of left underweight and short and left chasing it so i don't i don't think i don't think this pump ends uh yet um i, I think with obviously fed coming out in uh, what next week um that's going to be an important moment but i i think we've probably got at least a decent first quarter first half ahead of us um and then yeah then then who knows what the world looks like at that point mm, fascinating so many kind of topics there like i thought especially the kind of the idea of quickening cycles are quite interesting because one of the one of the especially kind of coming into the November rally in 2021 one of the big ideas was like lengthening cycles as the asset class kind of gets bigger it's slower to move um, but obviously that kind of didn't end up playing out and it's almost like the speed at which we went into the previous high in what was it July kind of that was almost that surprised everyone because it was so much faster in such a shorter time frame than kind of most people were expecting so it's kind of It'd be interesting to see then if going forward that kind of happens again, where the bear market ends sooner than most people expecting and kind of resumes resumes faster. Um, but but, but it, if you if you think of um, again, if if you kind of subscribe to my framework of sort of rates and liquidity being key to all of this, mm -hmm. then within that context it makes sense, right? Because if you think of over the last re really sort of post financial crisis. You know, monetary policy played out quite slowly, like the Fed hike cycle um, that began in, what, 2014, I think, um, was so slow and it was incremental. And I think it got pushed back initially. So we, we had we had like a, an EM sell off and everything in, in 2014. Um, and then the, then the Fed kind of said, OK, maybe we don't start hiking yet. And then they went gradually, gradually, gradually. Um, and then, you know, it's a very slow cycle um until and then and then we got to like late 2018 um and i remember powell saying in november 2018 we're a long way from neutral and then markets 2018 there was barely an asset class that traded positive by the way um because the fed were hiking even though the global economy was doing pretty well mm. um but the fed were hiking and taking liquidity out they're doing qt there was barely an asset class that traded positive oh. then Powell in twenty in November twenty eighteen said we're a long way from neutral. Um, market shit the bed. Um, you know, December was awful. Uh, a couple of months later, they were back cutting rates, and then in September twenty nineteen, I think um, you had the repo blow up, and then the Fed were essentially doing QE again. Um, but that whole process played out. Now then we had th then you had like twenty twenty came big blow up and then it was like you know huge qe huge fiscal and then we had like that year of 2021 where we cut from that and then 2022 was like the fastest rate hike cycle uh we've seen in history so the these fed cycles and rates and liquidity cycles have been like on on hyperdrive mm. so i kind of think that's gonna speed up um, the cycles that we're typically used to seeing in, in crypto and other risk assets. Mm. Kind of, I keep keep more questions keep popping to my mind. So whenever you got to go, <laughs> please feel free to let us know. But um, kind of one, kind of quickly touching on the institutional interest you are seeing. Where is it kind of directed in any particular area? Um, and then two, in terms of regulations. I mean, we always say regulations coming, regulations coming. Do you see that as posing much risk to kind of the altcoins in general? Um, and yeah, what's the kind of sentiment with the institutions? Yeah, so so in, in terms of flows, um, to start the year, all, all the flows have been sort of dominated by like top side buying of, of Bitcoin um, and less so Ethereum. So there's been a lot of like shoulder date buying of, of Bitcoin, which looks like a kind of play on the Fed. So starting the year, we saw a lot of like 27 Jan um, calls being bought, um, like around like, like 20, I actually started starting the year, it was like um, buying like 
like 17, 18 K calls. And now they're getting rolled up to like 23 K. Mm. And then some of those dates are getting pushed out to like February, March dates where we start to see like 28 K 30 K type level calls being bought. Um, so the focus has been on Bitcoin, which kind of tells me that a little bit, it's a, you know, plan a fed and a change in sort of monetary policy type play. Um, Ethereum's sort of been lagging a little bit. Um, the stuff we've kind of seen there, similar in terms of buying of, of call spreads. So I think people plan a little bit. Um, so, so the froze there. I think oh, people sorry. are planning for the Shanghai upgrade a little mm. bit. When, when is the Shanghai upgrade? Uh, March. March. Yeah, it's due March. So I think some people are, are playing around that. Um, so yeah, so it, it definitely feels uh, sentiments more bullish. If you look at skew so skew being um how uh, the, the volatility in puts versus calls so for a long long time basically puts have been more expensive than calls like a 25 delta put is more expensive than a 25 delta call um that's now flipped so now calls are more expensive mm. which tells you that there's there's more demand to buy option premium for the top side than there is for the downside so which kind of uh, you know, quite simplistically tells you that institutions are positioning now for the upside, um, not so much for the downside. So that's kind of been the flow that we've been seeing. Um, yeah, which, which, which is interesting. Um, you asked about regulation. Um, I, I think everyone in the institutional space wants it. They want, they want the clarity that it's going to bring. Now, obviously it brings risks and, and, and in terms of, um, you know, what, what that regulatory backdrop will look like. Uh, how you know how different altcoins are going to be classified and what have you but ultimately um, I think everyone just wants the clarity because right now I'd say that's the thing that's delaying some of the adoption because they they need that they need that uh, regulatory framework with which it, to come into the space so it's, it's kind of a risk in that we, we don't know what it's going to look like um, but it's also the thing that everyone needs um, just as long as, you know, it's not um, it, a, a level of regulation that's overbearing and, and kills like the innovation in the space. Like DeFi. Exactly. Like DeFi. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, like everyone wants it. We're just worried about what, what it might look like, but like we, we can't have like full scale institutional adoption without it. Um, and, and, and there's an argument if you look at FTX um, and stuff like, it's the lack of regulation that's forcing people to, to use these like offshore exchanges and what have you. So I think post FTX, it's like, look, you guys need to sort it out and get a regulatory framework because like, like we, that's, that's what everyone in the space wants. And we, we don't want the bad actors involved uh, in this. Now, again, like we don't want it to be like, like regulation should be there to protect consumers and to basically prevent like, crime um and all these things and money laundering um we don't want it to kind of uh impinge too much on on like the kind of core values of crypto and DeFi and, and decentralization now the worry of course is that it's a threat to current systems of governance current the banking system so do they go so heavy-handed that it, it makes an issue and again these are the uncertain things but you know i i think I think if you probably look back during the sort of whole dot com boom, um, I think those kind of fears were there as well, right? About how how much would the tech sector be kind of regulated? Um, and I, I actually think, from an investment point of view, like that's that's kind of where you're getting paid for the uncertainty in that, because once all these once all these things are once all these things are sort of clarified and we and we have some transparency and clarity on how things play out. Um, then o often then, you know, your opportunity is gone. Um, so again, it's not, not, to, not to shield people to get into crypto, but it's kind of the, the volatility comes with that uncertainty. But if you believe in the space, that's kind of what you're, you know, you, you accept that as part of the journey um, to hopefully we get to a good place with it. But I mean, if I go back to a few years ago, it, it, all of these washouts feel very different to me. Um, if I go back to like, uh, what, 2017, 2018, 
when we when we had those kind of bear markets and and i was sat there questioning you know have i got this wrong like maybe this was just a little fad that's going to go away um now now the level of interest the fact that that central bank digital currencies are coming um you know the acceptance of blockchain technology at least um as being sort of uh you know going to be a fundamental part of of banking infrastructure going forward um you know the fact that you have you know countries adopting bitcoin um the fact that you now have the likes of blackrock um you know adding bitcoin as an asset class mm. uh, to some of their funds like a few years ago that would have been unthought of so i think for all the noise and and all the bad sort of press that uh crypto is rightfully got um you know, over last year, there's also a lot of really good stories underlying it. And actually, from an adoption point of view, we've actually come a long, long way. Um, and this is now talked about very much in the mainstream. And only a few years ago, it was very fringe. And uh, likes of Bloomberg would hardly talk about it. Now, now they're actively reporting on this stuff. So I actually think we've come a long, long way amidst all the noise. Um, and, and it's not going away, and that's clear now. So I, I used to say to uh, I used to say to people who thought I was mad going into this, like, look, I know I know the bet I'm making, and it's either it's either zero or hundred x. That's kind of how I saw it. Well, now now I kind of feel I've taken the zero probability off the table, actually. Mm. So now 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 I'm left with a hundred x. Yeah. Now now whether, whether we quite get there is, is another thing. But but, but it's, it's not going away, and I, and I I think we're kind of past that hump. So now it's just about you know how big it becomes, how successful it becomes. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I'm I'm pretty positive in, in terms of the direction of things right now. Mm. Awesome. Awesome. As we wrap up. Um, do you have any kind of final comments for your readers? And also, where can people find you? Because I know you've started pushing and really working on your excellent newsletter that you're kind of pumping out. Um, so yeah, final comments and where to find you. So it's a final comment to say, I think um, the I think we, we're experiencing a, a macro regime shift. Um, I don't think this is a bear market rally. I think this is a change in the macro regime. Um, I look at rates, I look at liquidity, I look at the dollar and all, all of those are suggesting that we're, we're in for a, a much better sort of period. Um, and I think this risk rally continues and, and they're the things that I'd look at and, and would value over, you know, recession fears or earnings, you know, related fears. Um, I think this macro dynamic is very different to the one that we experienced in 2022 and is going to be a lot more supportive for for risk and, and certainly the beaten up uh, high beta plays like crypto and, and tech. Um, in terms of where to find me, uh, you can find me on Twitter at David Brickell 80. Um, also at Trade Paradigm. Um, and uh, if anyone wants to sort of go into paradigm.co, uh, where you'll find out a, bit, a little bit more about what we do at Paradigm. Uh, you mentioned the newsletter as well that I've been writing. Um, I'm actually going to start writing that in-house for Paradigm as well. So uh, keep an eye on that. Uh, but again, all details of that will be at, at Trade Paradigm um, on Twitter and, and at David Brickell80 uh, on uh, Twitter. Um, giving away a little bit of my age there, but there you go. <laughs> Thank you, David, for a wonderful conversation as always. And this is the bit where I now remind you that we are holding a blockchain retreat on the 11th to the 14th of May where you'll find fresh food, yoga, breathwork, sea swims, a sauna with a wonderful view of the sea, and of course, talks, panels, and workshops all about Bitcoin, crypto, and blockchain. David will actually be a speaker there, where he'll be breaking down the macro at the time and holding a workshop so you can start breaking it down too. There are only 100 spaces, so please head over to our website at kalshid.org.uk where you can register your interest so that you are notified when tickets go live. That is all for today and see you next week.